Hey folks, Shannon Messer here coming to you live from Tuckasegee Fly Shop in Silva, North Carolina, Jackson County to be more specific. And actually, we are actually in the heart of the North Carolina trout capital. Um, so if you've never been here before, we'd like to invite you into our home here. Come and fish with us. Come and explore the area, the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and all the wonderful national forests we have. Um, I am sitting here in the shop today because typically we have much, much better internet here. Plus, it allows us the ability to uh, give you different camera viewpoints. And Bobby, the bearded wonder Bennett, from you folks that might know him from the Tuck Cast with a splash of bourbon, and also from our YouTube channel. Um, he's going to be working the switcher board, trying to get me the questions and things like that. Now, speaking of questions, if you have a question, just kind of type it in there. We'll try to get to them when we can. If we don't get to them, rest assured, we'll try to you know, go through this, kind of look at them, answer those questions there for you. Going to keep it real simple, short and sweet, to be honest with you. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, if I can't tie a fly that I want to use in five minutes or less, I usually don't want to use it. However, I will take longer on these flies just to go over a couple of things there with you. The one thing about these dry flies that I'm going to tie for you today is that these flies are flies that you're going to find in the Smoky, uh, actually in a fly fishing museum uh, down in Bryson City, North Carolina, where our other shop is. We have two locations, 3 Depot Street, Bryson City, 530 West Main Street, Silva. Uh, but these flies, they have some significant importance to the local area. I've been used here for families, developed by families, and then have gone on beyond that. Uh, so I'm gonna share four patterns here with you today, time permitting, and we'll get through those. One thing to keep in mind, feel free to visit our YouTube channel, Takasiji Fly Shop, for the time videos that I do, instructional videos there. There's a lot of good information on that. Plus, you can also watch some of our podcast if you haven't done that already. Uh, and also kind of hit us up on all the social media accounts. Um, that's uh, Facebook, Tuck CG Fly Shop, and at Tuck Fly Shop on Instagram, the ground there. So we try to keep everybody up in tune with what's going on there. Uh, we're just a bunch of good people here, just a small town, and we like to have some fun. So we are going to hop into the first pattern. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Hope everybody's doing good out there. Had a good, good day so far. Appreciate you guys letting me come into your home. So the fir first fly I'm going to tie for you today is not going to be the Charlie Whopper. Psych. Uh, that'll be fly number two. The first fly I'm going to tie for you is actually going to be the Adam variant. The Adam variant is a fly that came from Fred and Eileen Hall out of Bryson City. Uh, developed back in the 1940s. And it is a great fly here, especially this time of year inside the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, especially the Deep Creek area outside of Bryson City. This fly, for me, has produced some wonderful fish, some really good topwater activity, some really good browns. It's a pretty fly. It's a fly that I tied, but I did not submit for the March Madness competition. So a few folks have actually seen this fly, but I want to tie that up for you. So today I'm going to be tying this up here on an Orvis 1523 in a size 10. And I'm going to do 10 on these so it makes it bigger. It should be easier on the eyes uh, for you folks there. So I'm going to go ahead and take my hook and get that put in here in the Norvice. And I'm actually using the, uh, the Legacy version here with the uh, Magnum hubs. Now the one thing about these Magnum hubs, man, you know, you get to spinning this guy here. These things will spin faster than the F-14 leaving the flight deck of the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. And, and I know about that specifically. So anyway, these things are pretty sweet. If you don't have any of the Magnum hubs, you should consider getting a set of those. So I've got my hook in the vise. I'm going to take my black thread. I'm using some 10 Vivas. Feel free to use the type of thread that you like. That's the most important thing about that. So I've got in there like so. And I have taken my thread and broken it off. Um, if I can share with you folks one tip today is I like to keep my scissors in the palm of my hands at all time. Surprisingly, I haven't poked myself yet, but I do have glasses on. Uh, but that's one thing. It's a little uncomfortable at first, but if you do want to tie flies a little bit quicker, if you get to where you can be comfortable keeping those scissors in the palm of your hands, that's going to be great. For the wings on this fly here, I'm going to be taking some of our uh, white feathers off of, a, off of a cape here 
And what I've done is I've made some hackle, I've cut some hackle wings using the fingernail clippers. Now these are pretty fancy. These came from the Dollar, dollar Tree, as a matter of fact, for a buck. I got two sizes, I got a big pair, got a small pair. And I'm going to reference you folks back to our YouTube channel to where I did the mayfly wings, the cut mayfly wings. That's about a four minute video if you want further instruction on that. But in the meantime, just to save time, I've already cut us up a real nicely matching pair of white wings here, okay? Now feel free if you want to, if you want to substitute calf body hair, you want a hair wing, certainly do that. That is not a problem. I'm a firm believer that you are in control of your flies. You are, this is their blank canvas. Now, if you noticed, as I walked my way down the hook shank there, I kept kind of building, uh, pulling up on those stems, and that actually allowed me to break those off. Now, I'm gonna take these wings, I'm gonna stand them up. As you can see, I got a beautifully matched pair of wings right there. Put a few figure eight wraps in there like so. Boom, boom, just like that, beautiful. Super, super simple. And right there we have a set of wings. It's a great way to use some of those feathers that you that you might not have a use for. Um, it's a great way to do that and then just discard the rest. Now for the tail on this, we're gonna use some golden pheasant tippet. Golden pheasant tippet, you can get in a tippet just like this or you can go ahead and get the entire uh, head of the bird. Now we use this here and a gentleman was hitting me up there on uh, Facebook the other evening about the secret weapon nymph. Once again, that's actually a Fred and Eileen Hall pattern too. Uh, this crest material in here, don't know how well y'all can see that, but that right there is a great material on some of these nymphs around here. It works really well. So if you get the entire head of the bird, you got all these feathers plus some crest material. Or if you just want to tip it, we got that here as well. These can be found here at our shop, tuckacgflyshop.com, tuckflyshop.com right there. So I wanna take some of this golden pheasant tippet here. Everybody says a pencil width, and I never understood a pencil width. I could never estimate how wide a pencil was because you had carpenter pencils and you had number two pencils. And as Bobby and I were talking yesterday, we were talking about doing mechanical drafting and Bobby was doing, um, some landscape design plans. We're talking about the different pencils and the different leads. So I've taken me a bundle. I've tied that in, make sure that that got on top of the hook and I've made some securing wraps with that golden pheasant tippet. It's great. It's got the orange and black. It's just a really, really good attractant. Okay. So now we're going to take a small hackle feather and we're going to take a grizzly and we're going to tie that in there in the back. You see, you take this little feather here and I'm going to take, I've already given it a haircut. I'm gonna get that secured in right there right quick. And this is a heavily hackled fly that is meant to really ride, uh, you know, high up on the water we have here and take notice, hopefully catch the attention of those fish. And it certainly does. Now I'm gonna be a brave man. I'm actually gonna use my hackle pliers here just a second. And with the rotating feature of the Norvice, I wanna make a few wraps in here in the back. Now, I don't care how ugly this kind of gets back here. That's fine. That's, that's not as important. We're just going to get this in here. Perfect. Close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. Okay. Bring my thread back over. I'm going to capture that. Boom. 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 Come in here like so. Capture. And cut that off. Trim it. Beautiful. Hope everybody can hear okay and everybody's seeing this all right. Looks pretty good on our end, I think. And we are getting some thunder here. Everybody's got doing good, hopefully. Clean it up just a smidge. All right, so the next material I'm gonna use is gonna be some yellow ostrich hurl. And this is a flume of an ostrich. Maybe y'all can see that. Kind of looks like Big Bird from Sesame Street. If you can still watch Big Bird on Sesame Street if it doesn't offend nobody. So we'll use some of that. Now this stuff is pretty brittle. It is very, very brittle, as you can see, but it's, it's awesome. It makes a really great uh, little highlight here in the center of this fly. Uh-oh, we do have a storm. Hopefully it's showing up okay. It's freezing up a little bit. Uh-oh, okay. Let us know, folks. Comment there, give thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever y'all are preserving so we have some feedback. 
Okay, perfect. I've got that tied in there right quick. Now I'm going to take this ostrich curl here. I like to tighten up the, uh, the tension screw on the vise, and I'm just going to wrap it just like this, making that bot part of that body right in there. See that? It's real pretty. Okay, go a few more wraps right there. I want to bring my thread back over and capture that. You can certainly substitute out different colors uh, on this here, but yellow is certainly the main color on this particular pattern, and it's my favorite one to fish. Just going to discard that there right quick. Beautiful. All right, put in a half inch. I do mine a little bit different than Tim does and some of you folks there, but the point is it still does the same thing. As far as hackle, we're going to use a grizzly off of a nice saddle. Then I'm going to use a grizzly dyed Coachman Brown off of a saddle. Typically this pattern calls for a grizzly and a brown, or as we call them, Domineckers here in the south. Uh, but this dyed brown, uh, this grizzly dyed brown makes an awesome, uh, gives some great colorization. So I like to use it. And besides that, sometimes procuring some of these feathers are really tough to do right now as well. So going to lay me down a little bit of a base here doing some traditional wraps. Go here and put me a half hitch. And I've got those feathers tied in. And what I'm going to do, what I like to do is spin both these at the same time. Now, these feathers here are wings. You can see I can push those out of the way. Now, with good tension on the rotation feature of the vise, I'm just going to use my finger and just wrap this bad boy up. Now, when I get here, I want to pull my wings back. As you can see, hopefully y'all can see that okay. Beautiful. This is a pretty fly, but it fishes even better than it looks. A lot of hackle on this fly. It's a heavily hackled fly, but that's what we're after, okay? Now I want to come up in here, bring my thread back over, capture, go in front, go behind a few times, just like so. Get that out of the way. I'm going to come in with a half hitch. Whammo, do another one, just like so. Beautiful. Get that out of the way. Take my Dr. Slick fine point scissors. Have a great selection of those here at the shop if you're looking for a pair. I'm going to reach in here like so. And bam, just like that. Beautiful. Now, that's a good looking fly. We're going to try to keep it together by using a whip finish tool here. I want to put a series of two whip finishes in it. One, two, three, four, five, just like that. And then I'm going to go back the other direction, overlapping that. Boom, we've got some redundancy built into it. And just like that, we have an atom variant in a size 10. I do fish these in 10s and 12s. Uh, you can tie them in 14s, but I like more of the bigger flies. Uh, most of these here that we sell in the shop are more in the size 12 category, but I like bigger flies. I think you guys can tell from some of my Facebook posts, you guys that follow me there. But that right there is an Adam variant. It's a Fred and Aline Hall pattern out of Bryson City, or more specifically the Alarca area of Swain County, North Carolina. But that right there is a really good looking fly right there. It uh, fishes really well, especially this time of year there. So if you folks have any questions, uh, be sure to hit them to us. Bobby can communicate theirs, theirs there to me. Hope everything's coming in good. Give us a thumbs up. We got a storm going on here. It got a big crack of thunder. So hopefully everything's going well. All right. So we're going to step into the next pattern, which is actually going to be the Charlie Whopper. I'm um, going to tie it on a size 10 as well. And this fly is actually one of our family flies. Uh, my oldest son is named after this gentleman here who uh, spent a lot of time with me in Panther Creek uh, working on old uh, fly patterns, teaching me a lot, making me write a lot of notes, but it was well worth it. And this is a fly that Charlie Bear came up with that is a really good fish producer here. I like to tie them in 10s and 12s. I like to fish them in 10s and 12s primarily. Uh, 14s, uh, you're getting a little small for this particular fly. Uh, 12 is the most common. And I've got folks who um, come in and they, they usually say, hey, I need three dozen of this particular fly. And I tie them up three dozen and put them in a side for them there. So they want big quantities of it. Yeah, man. Shoot. Uh, Norvice is asking, what do you use to point that fly? 
So I t- awesome. Oh, that's that's perfect, man. Thanks for asking that question. So there's many floatings out there on the market today. Um, ones that there's a few that I like. Uh, the high and dry floatants. I'm not here to really push any product, but we sell the high and dry. We're we're very 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 happy with the high and dry products. On this particular fly here, and on most of mine, I actually use the liquid. So after I tie this to the tippet, I just dip it down into the liquid and then go to go fishing with it for the most part. No CDC on here, it's a high floater. Uh, you could keep an Amadou patch close by if you wanted to. If it gets pretty pretty dirty, get a lot of fish slime on it, take that bad boy, dip it in the water, squeeze it out, man, retreat it, and rock and roll. Uh, that'll do the job. Some people like to use a brush-on applicator with some of the desic- desiccant, if I said that correctly. You can certainly use that as well. The gel will actually work on this. And then also the desiccant in the shake tube will also work that way too. So this is a fly that you can use various floatants and it will do the job for you. Okay, great question. Great questions. Slap me silly for not mentioning it earlier. So there we go. Uh, Really all these flies I'm gonna tie, you can use any of those there, but certainly on CDC, you have to be careful because you can mat down those feathers and you lose the ability of those feathers to trap the air, which gives them the flotation of it there. So hopefully that that uh, that answers that for you. You may be as clear as mud right now. So if that's the case, then I apologize for that. <laughs> Super. As you guys can see right there, I like to break my thread off. Anything that I can do that's really going to uh, to have me to do fewer steps, I'm all for it. So I've got my thread and one of the key thing on here, I know Grant and Braden, if you guys are watching out there that tie a lot of those streamer type patterns, uh, one of the problems that we see with folks doing dry flies is not understanding the proportions of the hook itself. So your scissors can be a great gauge for you. You can use that as like, uh, for like someone's a machinist, uh, no pun intended out there guys, uh, Tim and Tyler, uh, but you can use these here as a measuring tool and you can see kind of where halfway is and then where you're gonna put your wings in. So typically your wing, you go to your halfway point and then you almost cut it, cut the, cut your halfway point in half, which would be a quarter of the way back. Now, one of the things about the wings is when you tie it in, you have to understand you gotta fold your wings back. So if you get too far forward up here, you're really gonna crowd the eye of the hook. So if you do err on the side of caution, start with them a little bit further back until you get confident uh, to where you need to place your wings. Okay, just a little tip there for you. When I'm helping folks for the that are getting into tying, that's one of the things that I'll tell you. And then ugly flies catch fish, as you guys probably know about that too. Um, we're going to use some bronze mallard. Um, got some bronze mallard here. Got this right here. Love the bronze mallard. It is a great, great material to tie with. Uh, wood duck flank, things like that. Um, if you've tied with those, I just like tying with, with these types of feathers. Now I am going to take and strip off uh, some of this fluff on the bottom here. And this is just a super, super large feather, which I love. And I also like the fact that we got the darker feathers here too, okay? Um, so cool, cool, cool. Now I'm just going to grab me a bundle here. This is kind of where I deviate from Charlie Bear a little bit but we do have better quality feathers. Where there typically we had smaller feathers, we had to use two feathers to get our wings. Here, there's enough fibers on these and just big feathers that I only need to use one. And most of the time, one feather this size size is going to get me through the particular fly. So, uh, But you can ad- adjust that, line up your tips, and you kind of pull them off the stem so you get those guys. They're large, so I'm just gonna take and flip them and I want the tips of the wings to be facing toward the eye of the hook, okay? That's important. I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, obviously it'd be the opposite direction. And as far as the wing height, you can measure the shank of the hook. I tend to go just a little bit air on the side of caution being a little taller. I am going to give my bobbin a counterclockwise twist, which is going to cause my thread to jump backwards like that where if it would have been spinning the other direction, it's gonna cause it to jump forward, okay? So once again, there's another tip um, for you there. Gonna reach in there, get that pinched. I wanna look at it. How does that look? Looks pretty cool to me. 
I want to make some securing wraps right quick. And I want to take my scissors. I'm going to lift up the butt section, come in at an angle, and cut down like that. Now I'm just going to go ahead, while I have this here in my hand, I want to secure that. And um, this is a, one of the things I do on the Norvice. When I'm still kind of wrapping traditionally, I will loosen up uh, the locking hub on here, and I will actually rotate that to different positions. That allows me to see where the hook point is, and I can reach into those places as need be in there. So if you've not done that before, that might be something you might want to try. Now I'm going to take, I'm going to fold these, fold the wings back, take my thread, start building up a thread down in front like so, just like that. And I like to put a half hitch in at this particular point, just in case my thread breaks. I don't know about y'all, but my thread never breaks. Choke. That's a lie. Um, y'all know better now. As you can see, we got those nice pretty wings. And now I'm going to divide them in half to give me a pair of upright wings. Okay? So I like to kind of get in an angle so I can see. Hopefully you guys can see that V in there. At this point... You just start making some figure eight wraps in there to separate them out. Lock it. Now I go around here like this. Lock it. Perfect. There we go. Beautiful. Just like that. So we got an awesome set of wings at this point. I'm just going to turn it over upside down and come in and do that. That little straggler right there. I see it. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. It's kind of in the way. I'm just going to reach in here and just trim it. Beautiful. All right. The tail on this, bronze mallard. Real simple. Cool. So I'm going to get me a clump. I'm going to pull them out to the side like that. They're lined up. I'm just going to pull it. Same way you would pheasant tail off of a, if you're tying a pheasant tail nip, same way. Got them. Once again, how long do you go with the tail? I kind of say about the length of the shank of the hook. It's close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades, to be honest with you. I'm going to trim this up just a smidge. Get what I'm going to work with. And this is where I'll usually put in one or two wraps. I'll look at it and see how long it is. I kind of like the length on that one. I'm cool with that. I'm just going to come in here like this and just spin this up right quick. Okay? Beautiful. Now we've got a tapered body. If you folks can see that, that's really cool to have that taper in through there. It gives us a nice little set of wings, and we have a nice tail. As far as as the material on the body of this particular fly we actually used a very very i want to say graphite charcoalish yarn and i have just a smidge of it left of the original materials uh, but i found that the muskrat hair in the natural color is very very close when it gets wet so what I've actually done today is actually taken a patch of muskrat and made my own dubbing there. Uh, but Adam's Gray, if you want to tie some of these up yourself, the Adam's Gray will work. Or even something maybe just a smidge darker will work as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Any more questions there? Are we still rocking? Cool beans. Good deal. All right. So I'm just going to take this here. There's a few guard hairs in there. That does not scare me, to be honest with you, okay? I left those in there. I didn't get too picky. Now, I'm just going to go through this dubbing and kind of mess with it just a smidge in here. Now, as you know, on the Norvice, you can come in here and you can spin your dubbing on. But for this particular material, I like to just do it more the traditional way. And that's the great thing about fly tying. You can do it many, many different ways. But I want to kind of get a feel. I want to build my taper up. But with this fur like this, uh, especially when I'm working back here in this back section, I can control how thick I want to go with it. And I'm going to put it on a little thick. Um, typically, on your dry flies, you want to have a thin dubbing noodle. But I'm going to go a little thicker on this. This is a fly that we went, you know, just a little, just, just go thick with it. It ain't going to hurt it. It's going to get eaten up anyway. We're going to start with that there. Hopefully, y'all can see that. I'm going to make a few wraps here. Get that started. Start coming up. I'm going to loosen up my vise, and I'm just going to spin it up like so. And right there is our body. Like I said, I like to have mine personally a little big. Um, that's just me. That's just the way we tied it. 
Certainly, if you want a thinner body, you can do so. The fly time police should not come behind you and really start to call you out on it. Now, where this fly differs from maybe an Adam's pattern, uh, male Adam, female Adam, uh, like Cahill, any of your mayflies with the upright wing, is we actually have a wing that's going to go down over the back of the fly. And I really kind of feel like that's one of the keys to the success of this particular fly is it gives you a couple of different looks. All right, so I want to take me a clump of the bronze mallard once again. And I got to be honest with you, I have some that are just the biggest, ugliest thing. And I have some that, that they're a little bit, you know, neater and a little bit smaller. But I typically find that sometimes the bigger, ugly ones do fish better. I think it creates a little bit better silhouette on the water and that's what the fish are looking for. So here we have a pretty good population of, uh, of mayflies, caddisflies, and some stoneflies. But once this wing kind of goes in over the back and it's on the water, it can really imitate three different patterns or bug classifications if you really think of it in the adult life cycle. Um, I also tie this in purple. Um, and, but I use more of that uh, golden uh, color wing and stuff on it uh, there. And that's really one of our, another one of our good sellers at the shop. Um, there, it works really well on our, our wild fish. And it works, this fly will work here and it will work out in Montana and Wyoming as well. It's actually worked in California too. So, yeah, man, shoot. I'm, uh, do you like natural or synthetic? You know, uh, it really depends on the fly pattern. It really depends on the pattern. I was pretty much raised up on more of um, naturals, um, hares dubbing, um, muskrat, uh, hares mask, uh, squirrel, things like that. However, I feel like one of the biggest changes in the fly fishing industry has come in fly tie and it's been synthetic materials. We have some pretty, pretty awesome stuff out there in the market, which gives a really good look on the water. The one thing I will caution you, though, is, you know, you guys that do a lot of these streamers and stuff, and it's real intriguing to me. For us, I have to do what they call a color fast test. Just because this is this color here right now, when it's wet, it's going to take on an entirely different color. So if you're looking for a specific color, and you're trying a synthetic over a natural, you probably want to keep you like a cup and after you tie it, wet it to see what it looks like. The other factor that can affect that is going to be the color of thread you use. If I want to fly that I want the body to be a smidge brighter, then using a white thread, and I stress a white thread, and taking a Sharpie and coloring the thread up here at the head when you're done will help you tremendously. So if I take some, um, let's say that I'm using some, um, if I'm doing something in white, let's say I'm trying to, trying to tie a coffin fly and we're just gonna pretend like this poly here for a second is some white dubbing. If I use a dark thread on this, when this gets wet, you're gonna see that black thread, regardless if it's natural or if it's synthetic, okay? So for me, I would use a, the white thread on this. On some of the yellow flies, you can use yellow thread or you can use white. Um, the orange snipe video that's up on our uh, YouTube channel right now that some of y'all have seen, uh, that is one there that um, if you, you can use a dark thread if you do a thicker body and when it gets wet, it's, it looks kind of a little veiny or if you want it to be brighter, use the white thread. It's gonna give you a little bit br brighter body and that's a synthetic material. So. Great question. I appreciate that. And, uh, and then we got, uh, since we, while the storm was rolling through, yeah. um, we got somebody asking for you to give the history of the fly again. It was skipping through. That. Okay, cool, cool. That would be the Adam variant. That particular, if are we talking about Adam variant? I'll uh, give them both. One okay, time. I'll give you both. So the Adam variant um, is a Fred and Eileen Hall. They're from Swain County, North Carolina, uh, more specifically the Alarca area. And they tied flies commercially for ever and a day. And great fly inventors, uh, the Adam variant here, the first one that I tied for you, the secret weapon nymph, amongst other things, are some of their popular ones there. 
they um, came up with this pattern back in the 40s. And uh, if you talk to James Conner, James is uh, a great friend of the shop. He's been a mentor to Dell and Bobby and all of us. James is in his mid-70s, and uh, James uh, would set with them and tie with Fred and Eileen Hall before they passed away um, there. And this is one of the, one of the flies that they tied in, in abundance because it was such a great producer here. Once you leave the region, you really never see this fly, or at least I haven't. Um, there, but I'm sure it would work in other places. But uh, but I like the fact that it's it's very buoyant uh, and it's actually visible, really visible. You can do it with uh, you know with uh, hair wings if you like. I just like these white white wings. I've seen them with grizzly wings. I just like the white. It helps me with visibility. The Charlie Whopper here, uh, and let me before I get into that, I do have the grizzly and a brown feather here as well. This is one of our family patterns, uh, Charles Cameron Messer, otherwise known as Charlie Bear, uh, from down on Panther Creek in Haywood County, North Carolina. This is a pattern he came up with, and we fished it in the Cataloochee Valley, Big Creek, uh, areas of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, uh, Cunnelufty, uh, Bradley Fork, and around in various areas. Um, this fly here uh, and kind of the unique thing about this, as I mentioned before, is having this down wing on it. It's a very dark fly, and I like to fish them real big and bushy. I've got, uh, since Charlie Bear's passed away, family members that call me up and say, yeah, I need those in tens, but real big hackle. Um, so I'll obviously tie those up for them with some really large hackle on them there. 10s and 12s, to be more specific, is probably what you should be tying in this fly and fishing it. I can vow, I can honestly say this, it's worked all the way from North Carolina, Tennessee to California. It's taken fish, um, and it's, it's a real good uh, fly. It is dark, I will tell you that. It casts a really dark silhouette, depending on what type of optics you're using. It may be a smidge difficult to see. Uh, but as far as the floatant, let's kind of hit that as well. Last question. Um, you can use all the ones I mentioned before. You could use a liquid. You could use a gel. You could use a brush applicator. Or you could use one of the, sh the shaking desiccant type ones as well. Do series of two whip finishes on that in there. Come in like this. Build in some redundancy. Because this fly will get eaten. I'll tell you that. Okay. And so that right there is the Charlie Whopper. Uh, one of one of our favorite flies to fish and honestly it's one that people come in the shop asking for uh, from other areas there but that's the charlie whopper right there in the size 10 probably my favorite size to fish good deal so there's that one there hope you guys can see that hope you guys like that particular fly hope it looks pretty cool there's actually a video up on our youtube channel uh, where i tie this particular fly as well if you want any further instructions and with that being said these particular flies, um, you will be able to see them uh, on the YouTube channel as well, and as well as probably the Norvice channel uh, the next week or so. So good. Perfect. So I'm going to switch thread colors because I'm going to do two other particular patterns and see where we go from there. Any more questions? Golden. Perfect. Beautiful. <coughs> Hope everybody's had a good day out there. Get a little bit of drink here. Ah, beautiful. So the next fly, awesome. So the next fly I'm going to tie for you is going to be the yellow palmer. The palmer is another popular fly here in the mountains of Western North Carolina. A little bit of you kind of hear it came from the Palmer family and or it's, it's referencing it was the way that the hackle is wrapped on this one. What I can tell you is the fish don't really care. The fish like this particular fly. You can tie it in yellow, olive, orange, green to really imitate a like a little green stone is a great color um, there. So those are your most common colors. However, I got a guy that was asking about some in red uh, yesterday. So I think I'll tie him up some there in red. So I told him I'd do that for him. Once again, I'm going to get my thread started on the hook. Bam, break that off. And get me a little bit of a thread base 
lay down on this particular fly here right quick. Span a rooney. Go back to the back. Now, I've got to do some uh, telling fibers on this one here. Excuse me. And for that, we're going to use a kind of your brown color here. And we're going to use Grizzly. All right. So I want to talk to you about these right here for just a moment. So these feathers, if you look at your, these feathers aren't cheap. Any you guys that tie dry flies out there, you understand that. It's not cheap. But you can take these uh, you know, capes and saddles, and you got a lot of different feathers. So when you get in here to your, to your capes, uh, you start to look at, you've got your real, real small stuff down here at the bottom for a lot of your smallers, 18, 20, 22s. And as you work your way up, you start getting into 16s, uh, 14s, and 12s, and 10s, and so on and so forth. But one of the common mistakes I see about these particular feathers is they think they're only for dry flies. That is not the case. Uh, you've got some of these larger webby feathers, if we turn on to the back side right here, which are great for micro boogers, uh, telling materials, hackle cut wings. These are the feathers that you should not discard. You should find a use for these. Uh, maximize your money that you spend on this stuff. They offer a lot of great use to you if you're real good about trying to find that just <laughs> the way to not throw them out. Now, over here on the side, you got more your spay hackle. Some people like to use those for your uh, hackle tip wings. If I take a pair and just kind of come up here, you can see that for maybe like your atoms and things like that. That's where they're coming from. Um, but what I'm going to do here right quick is I'm just going to pull off one, one big feather. Uh, I'm just going to select one there right fast. That looks pretty good there. Not going to be too crazy. So I've got one feather. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the brown. You can see the colors of that there. And one of the things that I look for in the feathers is look down close to the stems and see if there's any variations in it. I like having some variations in the particular feather itself. They actually make some really nice uh, flies. Some people will kind of stray away from that or just kind of go away from it. But I like having some of that darker accents in there. That's just me personally. It's just an opinion. And, um, but you can see, see how webby that is in there. You can imagine when you cut this down what you could do with some of these materials, maybe wrapping and getting some more of that soft tackle for maybe some of your streamers. You guys out there doing the streamer game, you might find some use for some feathers like this. So good deal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these feathers. I'm going to kind of stroke them back like this, one on top of the other. And I'm going to get me some telling materials. I'm just going to clean that out there momentarily. Beautiful like this. And the reason why I want to do this at the same time is that's going to allow me to um, have those tips pretty close uh, to the same same amount and the same size. So I'm just going to take, take these here. As you see, these stems actually have a little curvature to them right there. All right, come in here. Just pull those down briefly. Beautiful. Good deal. Come in here like so. You got a bunch of them. Inevitably, you're going to lose some, but now we have we have a mix of grizzly and brown fibers for the tail. And I'm going to kind of stick true to how this particular fly was tied. As far as the tail, once again, about the length of the shank of the hook, I'm going to take some of these butts. I'm going to trim them off there momentarily. Spin my bobbin counterclockwise real fast. That'll cause that to jump back. As you can see, I've got those kind of wrapped up top. Spin a rooney, just like so. Quicker than a hiccup. Okay, super duper. So now we have our tail. Now what's cool about this, it's a real simple fly. We're gonna have a, once again, a grizzly and a brown. Maybe you can see the theme that we're going with here today is that you can use some of these feathers over and over again for different patterns. Grizzly and brown are our most two dominant. So I want to take these feathers. I'm going to go ahead and tie them in here at the back of the hook. Real simple tie. Go ahead and get those secured in. And then we've only got one more ingredient left in this particular fly. 
that's going to be our dubbing. Uh, for the, the person who asked earlier about the materials, um, on this particular pattern, we would actually use baby yellow yarn. And man, it's pouring rain outside. Um, we'd use baby yellow yarn, but for this one here, I'm going to use, once again, some natural. This is hairs dubbing. You can see some of the guard hairs in there. And with that being said, I'm just going to do it the traditional way. Hopefully, we still got the feed going because the rain is coming down. What's that? We're going. Go. Go, go, go. Go, go. As our man Jack would say. Now they say, okay, how much dubbing to have? It should be able to kind of float away like that. That's great to work with. The one thing about dubbing is you can always add two, but it's a pain in the rumpus to try to take it off. Um, and also kind of be careful not to build up tumors through the body. Basically, um, you don't want to kind of get some spots that are bigger than others there. That's one thing to keep in mind too as you do this. So try to be kind of even as you can. Uh, and you can also wrap back over uh, the particular uh, fly as well. You can you can dub your thread a few times if you want to uh, to make that. So I'm going to start with that momentarily. See, I did not use dubbing wax, and I'm just going to come in here like so, start to build my body up. Now I could rotate this, and a lot of times I actually do 99% of the time. But just so you can see, slower motion, I'm building up a pretty smooth, even body. Uh, if you want to taper it, that's fine. It's not, that's entirely up to you. I don't think it fishes any better tapered or if it doesn't, if it's not tapered, I will tell you that. In my opinion, the rattier this fly gets after it's fish, the better it actually will fish. And um, for you folks there that read the blog post about uh, the big ugly, this is where it all started was right here with this particular fly and with really 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 super big hackle that was kind of sparsely tied in there almost to the point to where it might have been like a wet fly so there we go good deal perfect just a little bit more here because i want to keep room at the eye of the hook this is the one thing that uh, i see with people is when you're first doing this not giving enough space to be able to get to tip it through the eye of the hook you can have a pretty fly but if you can't fish it uh, it's not worth a hill of beans, to be honest with you. All right, so there we go. I can do just a little bit more in there. Bobby, we're getting some rain, man. With the street going to flood, man, it is actually pouring here in town right now. Don't know if y'all can hear that on the roof or not, but it is coming down. As they would say, cats and dogs. Can we drift the fly in the street? We might be able to drift a fly in the street in a minute. Come in here and kind of get rid of some of those guard hairs. I want to tighten down the tension knob on my Norvice. I want to grab these hackle fibers out of the materials clip. And I like to spin these together if I can most of the time. You don't have to. Come in here like so and just start walking that up the fly. Palmering that hackle up. And when I get up to the front, I'll make a couple wraps like that. Maybe one more. Perfect. Now, this is a grizzly. And once again, a brown or the grizzly dyed brown right there. It gives some great contrast to this particular fly. I capture my... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, questions. questions. Sweet. Uh, what bug do you think this fly represents? Or is it just an attractor? The palmer? Yeah. You know, great. Uh, that's a great debate. I feel like it's very similar to a caddis, except we have the tail. For us here, it's really a good attractor. Uh, it's quick to tie. You know, once you get fluent with this, man, you can tie these up pretty quickly, uh, especially on the Norvice. You can get the rocking and rolling. I feel like it's a little bit more of a tractor. It's kind of a hybrid. Let's say if there's a hybrid, this is kind of close to a hybrid. Um, you're not matching specifically the particular bug, but you're matching more specifically the color of the, of the bug. And it, I think that's where it comes from um, there. So wonderful question. I think it's just kind of more of a hybrid. Another one we got is um, 
Richard's saying, I notice you use a traditional dubbing technique rather than the Norvice method. Are you doing that for like instructional reasons to show them slow motion? Basically? I'm, correct. I do both ways. Um, it really depends on where I'm at on the body of the fly versus, uh, and also sometimes the material I'm using. Uh, but I'd actually do both. And, uh, but the one thing about that with the Norvice, I think you might've seen how I would turn it this way and, and, and get into those particular areas. I, f I use the Norvice maybe a little bit differently than some others, but that's how I like to use it. Uh, you know, spinning some of your naturals versus your synthetics, they will actually attach to the thread a little bit differently when you're spinning and you'll get a little bit different variation in that. But for today, and just taking my time, and anybody who may not be tying a Norvice that may want to start tying a Norvice, this is a great way to really get started on it. Great question. And then uh, Daniel wants to know what type of dubbing is that on that fly? This one here, this here is actually natural hairs dubbing that's been dyed. It's a pale yellow uh, on that right there. So I mentioned earlier a lot of naturals on our atoms. We would use this in an atoms gray. Uh, the Thunderhead, you know, a little bit more of a darker. Another great fly, which you can find on our YouTube channel as well. I'm going to come in here, do two whip finishes. <coughs> I like to leave area up here in the eye of the hook to where I can actually get to it. Um, come in here, a few of these fibers got trapped. Uh, but there we go. Real simple tie. It floats really well. And surprisingly, I did this a uh, bigger ones you can see pretty good on the water uh with a lot of our canopy cover at certain light conditions it may be a little bit more difficult to see uh, but if you kind of get more at a 45 degree angle with your drift you can see this fly pretty good and it's uh, there has probably been more fish caught on the yellow palmer than any of the other dry flies around here if you talk to most of your old timers this was one of the most favorite flies to for them to fish with Pale yellow, the kind of our most favorite one. Um, green, more of a chartreuse green is a great, great, great uh, stone, a little uh, green stone flight imitation, which are popping off right now this week. So we've seen those guys this week and fished some of those up on rough fork and stuff, and they did pretty good for us. So anyway, so there we go. Any more questions? Uh, as far as hackle, you can change that up. If you want to do this in a brighter yellow, you could do that as well. The brighter yellow is a little bit easier to see. Um, all right, so the next fly, where are we at on time? Um, been on for roughly about 45 minutes. Cool, awesome, great timing. So I had actually said we were gonna tie a Jim Charlie and I call an audible. Um, I know football's not playing right now, but I call an audible. And the reason why I did that was because we have a gentleman who ties a lot of flies for us who I feel like is a is a legend and uh, he's hurt right now he had an accident he fell at home and, and he's not able to tie but this fly that he has here is called a Smoky Mountain Mayfly and um, it is a super popular fly here in the shop I'm going to tie it close to what James ties but it's going to be off just a smidge because I don't have his exact materials here but James Connor, um, if you go to our, uh, oh geez, our, our website, tuckflyshop.com, and go under the guidelines blog, Dale wrote a post or a blog about James Connor uh, there. But James is, uh, James is in his mid-70s, uh, should be in the Fly Fishing uh, Hall of Fame down here, hopefully one day, hopefully sooner rather than later. And I'm actually going to tie this fly in honor of James uh just because he's just an inspirational guy and it's it's really a super super great fly for this particular fly here we're going to be using some uh yellow some feathers dyed yellow uh the body is going to be yellow <laughs> we're just going to use some uh some uh you know some yellow dubbing here now this is a synthetic on this particular one this is going to be a little bit brighter than what james ties uh for the tail it's going to be these same materials as well and the hackle will be the same material. So real simple, simple, simple fly. Um, before we get started though, I'm going to make us some wings here right quick. So I'm going to try to use as much of these feathers as we can. Uh, well, as I mentioned to you before, you can actually see this on our um, YouTube channel, how I make these wings, but I want to make us a set of matching wings. 
there strip these feathers down here right quick I'll show you what I'm doing I'm just taking some of these bottom webby fibers off in here like so hopefully y'all can see that pretty good and then I'm going to put my scissors down surprisingly and I'm going to pick up these uh, wonderful lovely uh, fingernail clippers that my wife bought me okay um, they're special <laughs> Now, if you can see, you have the curvature. That's the curve we're looking for for the wing. So we're going to take, I'm just going to kind of get a hold of this and hopefully you can see it. I want to come in here like so, hold my feather and just take and clip. So right there is one side of the wing. I want to turn it over and repeat that process. Come in here like so. So right there is one wing, just like that. Cool. Cool, cool, as our man Jack would say. Hope Jack's doing good. Good. Cool beans. Any more questions? No, but we got somebody from Chile and Australia. Chile, Australia. Very nice. Also, the uh, Project Thin Water from Knoxville gave a shout out. Cool beans, man. Awesome. Any folk? I, I will tell you, um, being a veteran, uh, I, I, I can say that um, those folks that volunteer with Project Tilling Waters, that's a great organization. And if you have a little bit of spare time to volunteer, and that may be you know tying flies and donating flies, that may be time on the water, um, that will all be appreciated. I'll tell you that right now. Um, if you ever want to know what the, what the cost of freedom is, all you got to do is walk, go to a VA hospital and walk down the passageway and find you a bench to sit on and watch everybody go by. That right there, you'll understand what the uh, what the cost of freedom is. And uh, I think at that point there, that'll motivate you to try to do what you can to help those folks that uh, may need a little bit of extra support. That this thing that we love to do called fly fishing and fly tying may make a huge difference in their life beyond what you could ever imagine. So um, huge shout out to them. And I also want to take time to thank... Uh, the O'Neills, um, Casey Miller kind of set this up here, and we've had some great people tying on these live events. We've had, uh, obviously, the O'Neills, Braden Miller, Brian and Britt Davenport, um, uh, Grant, uh, 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 Mr. Muncie with Muncie Designs has tied some really cool stuff, and it's been really good, and hope you folks are enjoying this. Question for yep. you. Yep, so uh, David wants to know, can you cut more than one wing from each feather? Yes, you absolutely. You sure can. I like to use a little bit more of the thicker stems. When you start to get up toward the top of the particular feather up in here, the stems get pretty weak. They start to get a little weak in through there, and they're not so great for that. But on those bigger feathers, like I mentioned to you earlier, uh, up in here in this particular section, this one here just seems to be super, super long. I can get multiple feathers out of those. And what I like to do is um, if I'm tying up a bunch, I will go ahead and get matching wings set out here, usually enough for at least a dozen flies to just increase that, just tying time, it's ready to rock and roll, okay? Hopefully that answers your question right there. And I found that out by accident, uh, that uh, the further up you go, just the weaker they get, and they're not so good. Uh, and I have to credit Roger Lowe for showing me how to make those particular wings right there. Um, I'm just sharing that knowledge that was passed on to me. All right, so I'm going to take these here because the stems are a little stiffer. You can push those back, and hopefully you can see the benefit of having a little bit thicker stem right there versus the thinner. It just makes a beautiful set of wings. Kind of go in front right quick, and I'm going to start to... Uh, I'll try to turn that sideways so you can see what I'm doing. Michael wants to know what kind of feathers are those again? These are just... Uh, this was a white uh, cape that was dyed yellow. It's, it's a dry fly. It's a, it's a whiting farms, uh, but there's other ones on the market out there. And for the folks that asked me about spinning the dubbing on, the one thing about this wing, which is cool, and it's also kind of the same thing with, um, with some synthetic wings. So if you're making um, some dry fly wings instead of, instead of using, um, you know, calf body, calf tail, which can be a little bit of a mess to, to, with some people, if you're using some poly material like this, this is actually how I make my indicators, and I do that on the Norvice 2, surprisingly. Um, 
you can actually once you get those wings on here i can actually tie i can spin this guy here as you see it's not breaking those wings so it's actually a very durable wing uh, but spinning that dubbing on i don't like those wings getting in the way when i'm doing that spinning action with the dubbing uh, I, I just don't want that to happen so uh, hopefully that shows you two things right there daniel uh, has two questions for you shoot daniel when you cut out the wings is it the same length of the blade of the clipper it is Okay. Yep, it's it the is. Exact design of the blade. Basically. Yep, that's exactly what it is. And then he also wants to know up to what size can you do this? I'm assuming maybe fly size is what he's asking. Um, yeah. So this one right here is a ten. Um, you can go. I mean, not many people are fishing a size ten dry fly um, here locally. Uh, but all you got to do, if you want it to be a little bit longer, and this is a great time for me to show you this actually. You want me to zoom out a little? If you if you want to, that's fine. Yeah, so because I'm actually going to use the bottom of this here for some telling material. So this is perfect. All right. So you see in here, if I take the um, the clipper here, and I'm trying to use the curve of this right here, okay? With all that that I have spaced out in there, all I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it in here like so. If I want to have a bigger wing, I just kind of hold it they're a little bit bigger like that i'm going to finish cutting it and i'll show you okay but if i if i leave it to where my stem like on a bigger fly if you can leave it to where you have more stem exposed so you get a taller wing in there and then by the time you hackle that in you're good to go it works perfectly. So hopefully that right there answers your question on that. A real good question, by it the way. Takes some practice, right? It takes practice. It takes practice. Uh, understanding how to manipulate the feather and stuff. It takes some time, but it's it's a really great way to use all your materials at the end of the day. If you want to impress somebody with just an awesome, cool looking fly, that's the way to do it. Um, so now the tail on this, I'm going to use these bottom uh, feathers here. I'm just going to do like you would on a pheasant tail. I'm just going to grab the tips, got them lined up and pull them. As you can see right there cool great questions guys i appreciate that it's awesome once again about the length of the body close enough for horse using hand grenades if you look at most of the mayflies anyway they have super long tails uh, we may be mid a smidge short on most of those things anyway get those wrapped in there got that secured down boom i've got me a nice little taper in there like so hopefully you guys can see that now i'm actually going to use some uh, synthetic more of a golden color on this particular fly here james is maybe a little bit lighter than this here actually i know for a fact it is um, i know for a fact it is but i'm just going to kind of get this these fibers are just a smidge longer so i'm just going to go in here like this wrap them up and they this is a poly material so it sheds water really well too once again all these flies you can use any of your floatants that you like to use okay that's entirely up to you whatever you like to use have at it perfect as you can see right there i want to start bringing my body up just like so got a few little scragglers in there beautiful hopefully y'all can see that good and then uh, i'm going to add just a smidge more and then we'll have our hackle and this bad boy will be finished Cool, cool. Awesome. Let's get it right in there. Beautiful. Come in here half hitch just in case. Nothing ever happens, right? All right. So as far as the hackle on this here, we're going to use two of the yellow uh, same feather that we made the wings out of. So I'm just trying to maximize the use of my money and these feathers, okay? Um, maybe a smidge on a smaller side as far as this hackle size now at times i will pull off some of these bottom hackle barbules here and i know you guys have seen me do that a lot if you want to tie a fly that's just like crazy sharp um trying to blow somebody's mind your hackle wrap fibers will be much much uh, greater in there because you're not as you wrap your hackle and if you don't strip those barbules those bottom ones are they'll flare okay they start they're flaring and um it can get out of out of control however if you want just a crazy bushy bushy fly it's fine to have that in there i want to build me up a little bit of a thread base up front and i want to have this hackle it's going to come up to here 
And when I mentioned earlier about air to the side of caution and having your wings back a little bit, I'd rather have my wings back a little bit deeper on the fly than being up here and not being able to get any hackle up here and even getting the thread wraps on it up here, okay? That's important. So air on the side of caution. And I like longer feathers so I don't have to use hackle pliers. So I'm gonna grab both those. I wanna get them started. I wanna push those wings out of the way. Another reason why I like those, I wanna start just rotating my vise. If you only buy this vise for two things, Number one, the automatic bobbin. And then number two, wrapping materials on like this right here. It pays, will pay dividends over and over and over and over again. All right. Is, is there a, uh, ever a need to use a dubbing loop on dry flies? You can. That's entirely up to you. I use a lot of dubbing loops actually on nymphs, uh, but you can do that if you want to. That's entirely up to you and the technique and the style you like to tie with there. Yeah. And have you ever used this fly on uh, bluegill? I'm sure bluegill eat everything. Uh, <laughs> I have not. I have not. It's a funny story that you asked that right there, honestly. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm always full of stories. Um, talking about Brim and Bluegill, I got a friend that lives down in Gainesville, Georgia, by the name of Tim Ivy. And Tim was a real good fly tire. And Tim brought up a bunch of flies to me. And he gave me a woolly booger that had an olive tail, a silver bead, and a blue S Taz body. And he left me about three or four of them. And I carried that thing in my pack for quite some time, but I was up straight fork one day. I had fished back up to my vehicle and there was probably about a 15 to 20 foot deep plunge pool. And I could see, I could see the trout at the bottom of the pool. I got some up top, but man, there was some like larger fish that we typically don't necessarily see all the time in the Smokies. And I'm like, I looked at this thing and I'm like, you know, I'm either going to scare them to death, or I'm going to catch something. And I pulled out that, uh, that fly, that woolly booger, and I put it on, and four split shot later, I kid you not, when it got to the bottom, there was three rainbows that went and grabbed it, went grab for it. I got one. I actually got it on a GoPro camera. Caught it, one of the biggest rainbows I caught in the national park, which blows the theory that it has to match the hatch for it to catch fish, okay? So I'm talking to Tim, and I said, hey, Tim, man, I caught some trout. I caught some trout on that thing. He said, try out. And he said, you got to know Tim in Georgia. Try out. That thing's for bluegill, you know. So there you go. So if a bluegill pattern to catch trout, I'm sure a trout pattern to catch bluegill. Uh, but this right here is my variation of the Smoky Mountain Mayfly, which is uh, made popular by James Conner. He actually invented the pattern. We have a lot of yellow bugs here. So if you come to fish with us in the summer months and you come in and say, hey, what flies are we going to use? We're going to direct you to some yellow body flies, such as the... The Jim Charlie, the Smoky Mountain Mayfly, uh, Yellow Palmers, things like that, and, and then some more of the other stuff. So yellow is key here, and, and hopefully this is something that you'll try to tie. And you can obviously vary the colors. <laughs> it ain't, ain't a whole lot to this particular fly. So hopefully you guys can see that okay. And definitely shout out to James Conner, man. And uh, he, he's, a, he's a legend, and hopefully he'll be uh, recognized in the uh, Fly Fishing Museum uh, rather sooner rather than later for sure. So... Uh, Hopefully you folks enjoy that right there. Any more questions on that? Yeah, yes, that's perfect. So uh, I don't know what time is it there? Uh, you're right at an hour. Cool, cool beans. So we'll hang on here for a few minutes in case we get any more questions. Uh, happy Father's Day to everybody. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come into your home and tie up some flies there for you. I appreciate the O'Neills and, as I mentioned, Miss Miller, who kind of set the links up for this today. I think she's doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I appreciate all the other ambassadors that's tied. And uh, definitely, if you have any questions, you can email me at shannon at tuckflyshop.com, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, at tuckflyshop.com. You can follow me on Instagram. It's at Appalachian underscore flies, and Appalachian is A-P-P-A-L-A-C-H-I-A-N underscore, and then F-L-I-E-S. You can follow me there. I put a lot of the pics up of the, of the uh, flies that I tie. Uh, follow the shop. You can follow us on Facebook at Tucker CG Fly Shop. You can follow us, us on YouTube at uh, at Tuck Fly Shop, I believe, and then Instagrams at Tucker CG Fly Shop as well. 
tuckflyshop.com is always open. So if you have, you need to purchase any materials or anything like that, you can look us up there and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would. We'd really appreciate that and share with your friends because we, we're just regular folks like everybody else, like to have a good time and hopefully put out some good educational content. So uh, there we go. So with that being said, we've got no more questions. Hopefully this showed up okay. I will try to answer these questions as, as soon as I can if I didn't get to it. If you have any comments, certainly hit them up. I am leaving on an airplane early in the morning and won't be back till Sunday. But in between there, I'll try to do what I can for you folks. So once again, thanks for watching. Appreciate Bobby the Bearded Wonder Bennett. Listen to the Tuckcast of the Splash of Bourbon and all of your favorite podcasting platforms. We'll catch you next time. Take care.